It is my great pleasure to once again introduce Lionel's Not So Little Boy. <laughs> Brian L. Sesser has been teaching history for the last 22 years, even though he doesn't look like that's possible. Currently working at Webster University. He earned his PhD at St. Louis University and wrote his doctoral dissertation on the post-war decline of the St. Louis public schools. I assume that's the Second World War. Yes. <laughs> and the impact it had on the region. His specialty is 19th and 20th century urban America, and he has spoken at the Missouri State Historical Society on topics ranging from urban planning, the St. Louis public schools, and civil rights cases in St. Louis. Dr. L. Sesser is the founder of School Reboot, an education consulting firm dedicated to program development, curricular reform, and specialized administrative services. <clears throat> Dr. L. Sesser is an avid bicyclist and videographer. He enjoys city living and often rides his bike to work, admiring many of the city's older buildings and historic districts along the way. Dr. L. Sesser lives in a 110-year-old house in the Central West End with his wife, Christine, his twin daughters, Claire and Chloe, and his two dogs. <laughs> Are they boy dogs? One of each. Okay. <laughs> Brian. Uh, it, it's great to be back. Um, and thank you, Mary, for that nice introduction. Um, I also want to thank you for giving me this topic because I had never heard of Eva Perry Moore until given this assignment. And what's been so interesting is to realize that I've walked many of the same sidewalks she did uh, almost on a daily basis. When I walk my dogs in the Central West End, I think about all of these club women who lived there 125 years ago. So it's really been a, a, a wonderful experience researching for, for this topic. And, uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. I think you'll enjoy it. I'd also um, like to thank Marie Schwartz for your assistance in the audiovisual, and uh, a special hats off to uh, Virginia McCann, who uh, sat with me in the archives uh, last month and was present at some most interesting discoveries when we were going through some of those old scrapbooks. So, uh, anyway, let's let's get started. Okay. As the Wednesday Club of St. Louis celebrates its 125th anniversary, it's appropriate to examine the early days of the club, reacquaint ourselves with some of the founding members, and reflect on the club's agendas and activities. Given that the club's charter was written in 1890, a moment in history where only one state in the Union, Wyoming, granted women's suffrage, it's reasonable to understand that any question of politics was taboo and a potentially dangerous subject for the women who founded the Wednesday Club. In the early republic, Americans celebrated motherhood as a full-time job and an investment in the future. Good mothers would raise the next generation to be well-adjusted, productive, and moral citizens. Colonial and early American law espoused ancient traditions of couverture, which we'd say in English is coverture. It's an old French construct uh, that established women as property of either their father or their husband. Well, yeah, we can talk about that afterwards. It's really interesting. Uh, under the custom of couverture, men were expected to provide for their women in return for obedience, respectful children, and emotional support. For married women, couverture started with taking the husband's name, but often also meant acquiescing to his financial control, control and political tastes. Women didn't need to vote. Because as men like John Adams, one of our founding fathers, quipped in 1776, this is a letter to Abigail, we know better than to repeal our masculine systems. Although they are in full force, you know they are little more than theory. We dare not exert our power in its full latitude. We are obliged to go fair and softly. And in practice, you know that we men are the subjects. We have only the name of masters, and rather than give up this, which would completely subject us to the despotism of the petticoat. <laughs> he wrote that July 14th, 1776, 10 days after signing the Declaration of Independence. Uh, joking aside, this enlightened signatory 
was suggesting separate spheres of influence where at times men were the subjects, not the real rulers. In the traditional sense of couverture, women ruled by guile and beauty. In the late 19th century, however, modern industrialized society demanded that successful men marry urbane, intelligent partners. A newspaper feature, a newspaper feature in the St. Louis Globe Democrat with this illustration accompanying it from 1890 titled, Beautiful Women of Old St. Louis, alluded to how femininity had changed, noting that the contemporary woman, quote, a few generations ago, might have been set down as masculine and aggressive, but is now the charmingly athletic and intellectual companion of man, quite as beautiful in her robust way as her grandmother was delicate. <laughs> Fortunately for women in St. Louis, the confluence of wealth and immigrants in the Civil War left, or after the Civil War, left fertile ground for truly exciting intellectual culture. That period of St. Louis history is notable for perhaps our city's deepest foray into philosophy, with the founding of the St. Louis Philosophical Society by German immigrant Henry Brockmeyer. The German philosophers Kant and Hegel were elevated in St. Louis circles, while earlier works by Descartes and ancient Greeks were also uh, revered. Historian James Neal Prim wrote that, quote, wives and daughters of business and professional men thronged to classes in idealist philosophy, and their husbands and fathers gave the moral and financial support, unquote. This was the intellectual foundation of what would become the Wednesday Club, informal gatherings in the parlors of affluent women immediately after the Civil War. The oldest document I found went back to 1867, okay? Uh, but these are very like I say, informal. The fact that these early meetings took place in the home gave them a protected status as there was little cost involved and husbands could keep tabs on the conversations. <laughs> Intellectually curious women could get a taste of the wider world even while the oppressive culture of Victorian gender roles remained intact. A woman's domain was in the home and the social circles that emanated from it. In the context of Victorian America, the definition of femininity <coughs> emphasized homemaking, maternal obligations, and moral righteousness as reflections of a woman's civic engagement. The family, particularly in industrialized northern communities, had moved from a patriarchal model to an enterprise. Thus, men as breadwinners oversaw financial and political aspects of the family unit, while women took the lead in the family's social, social calendar and extended relations. In cities like St. Louis in 1890, women from wealthy families were expected to support their husbands and perhaps soften the strains of cutthroat economic competition by representing the family enterprise with grace and diplomacy. Indeed, the Victorian woman was expected to be a moral scion who was charming, beautiful, and inoffensive externally. <laughs> there was little room for political life under such a conception, and even political debates were considered off limits to Victorian women. In fact, there were strong female voices opposed to women's suffrage. Did you know that? Okay. Uh, Anti-suffragette Josephine Dodge argued that voting represented a divisive force in American families and that it would jeopardize the moral integrity of the American woman. Women who voted would soon play the roles of men and effectively muddy the waters of Victorian gender identity. In truth, American democracy at the turn of the century was often saloon-oriented, whiskey-infused, profane, and a male-dominated affair. Not surprisingly, those who agreed with Dodge associated voting in the, with the Victorian culture. Or, I'm sorry, they associated voting with the saloon culture. Uh, given the boozy culture of politics at the turn of the century, it was clear that it, uh, it was not an appropriate arena for respectable women. Finally, there were strong anti-suffrage smear campaigns and propaganda. The tall, square-jawed, unmarried, and childless Susan B. Anthony was regularly ridiculed as manly or a lesbian to the point where other women 
who espoused her views risked similar slander. Indeed, it was safer for privileged women to stick to the relatively inoffensive topics of art, poetry, and music. Even the notion of women's education bordered on controversy 125 years ago. Vocational education for women, namely going to college or trade school to get a good job, was preposterous in the 1890s. Certainly, it was understood that no respectable woman would choose careerism over marriage and motherhood. But there were some educational opportunities for women fortunate enough to live in enlightened households. Parents who understood the value of the liberal arts proffered educational opportunities to their daughters in order to make younger women happier, more interesting, and by extension, more attractive wives and more effective mothers. <laughs> Education for women in the 19th and early 20th centuries was generally more focused on moral fortification than economic or political empowerment. And the earliest programs of the St. Louis Wednesday Club clearly reflect this. In fact, one common joke was that the clubs were married women's colleges. <laughs> Founding member Cynthia Dozier described the aim of the Wednesday Club this way, quote, to lift women out of the commonplace, to give them higher ideals, and to place them on a stronger footing, to promote the growth of broad feeling and thinking, and to keep in touch with the greater world. Many bulkly Another founding member uh, wrote that, quote, a woman's club should fill the vacancy now existing in the life of the domestic woman. It should furnish means hitherto lacking for widening her mental horizon, offering her the mask, I'm sorry, offering her the discipline of gentle attrition with other minds, the benefit of other points of view, as well as an inspiration to study. When the Wednesday Club officially formed in 1890, there were 65 members, and they held meetings at the Union Dairy Building at Washington and Jefferson Avenues. Um, it's, do you guys know where the Lambert Furniture Building is? Okay, so that's, that's the location. Okay, uh, Given the pressure for women to remain apolitical in pre-suffrage America, it should come as no surprise that the respectable founders of the St. Louis Wednesday Club put together an unimpeachable inaugural program for 1890-1891. The fall of 1890 started with analysis of the great English poets Coleridge, Byron, and Wordsworth. This was followed by a winter program highlighting the constituents of landscape painting and comparing the English and American schools. In 1891, the program focused on French and German romanticism and various forms of German music. But there's also evidence that more practical matters were discussed that inaugural year. Perhaps the most germane topic to St. Louis women appeared in the spring of 1891 program entitled Humanism, Culture, and the Relation of the Club to the Home. While no notes on this discussion exist, one might imagine the topic of coaxing husbands for dues money came up. <laughs> By 1892, Wednesday, the Wednesday Club had 162 members, most living in the Central West End, Van Deventer Place, and the Compton Hill neighborhoods, all conveniently serviced by multiple trolley lines. Um, some of those houses also had stables for their own uh, horses. Uh, this was an affluent bunch, and their husbands were major real estate developers, lawyers, and industrialists. Mrs. Henry Elliott, T.S. Eliot's mother, was an influential member. And Susan Blow, the school teacher introduced kindergarten to the American schools, was awarded an honorary membership. That year, the club elected um, Miss Eva Perry Moore, a 39-year-old graduate of Vassar College, president. Okay. Eva Perry Moore was a bit of an outlier, given that she and her husband, Philip, a mining engineer, lived in Lafayette Square. And this is their house right there with the uh, turret um, right across from the park. It's very hard to find good pictures of her. This is a photograph from an Illinois newspaper taken in 1910, and it's probably <coughs> one of the younger pictures I could find of her. It's not good, I apologize. Both Moors were transplants. Philip was from Ohio, and Eva grew up in Rockford, Illinois. 
At Vassar, the young Miss Perry majored in French and botany and taught there for two years after she graduated. The Vassar newspaper noted that, quote, of the many splendid products at early Vassar, none stand higher than Eva Perry Moore. After teaching, she toured Europe for two years and upon returning met her husband. Philip's work required extensive travel throughout the US, Canada, and Mexico, and it appears that Eva and their two children often accompanied often accompanied him until they settled into their home at 1520 Mississippi in 1890. The contrast, uh, in contrast to women from the more established St. Louis families, Eva had a worldly demeanor and was remembered for her, quote, unusual grasp of fundamentals, a disregard for the frivolities of fashion, unquote, her, fearless, her fearlessness and her knack for, quote, achieving decision when decision was the thing. <laughs> the Moore's home at 1520 Mississippi still stands, and it is an impressive example of Victorian architecture. Still, its parlor was considerably smaller than those of her contemporaries, and while the neighborhood was convenient, serviced by new sewers and water lines, and eminently pedestrian friendly, it was not as tony as the newer neighborhoods further west that had room in the backyards for a stable. Clearly, Mrs. Moore was not outshined by more affluent members. In her obituary, she is remembered as a woman who, quote, wielded influence for the good over a wide circle, not only in her home community, but throughout the country, unquote, and who also, quote, could perform her dual role so acceptably and so admirably with, without neglect to her family or to the multifarious services she performed in club circles, unquote. She was an exceptional organizer and perhaps a bit pushy. <laughs> the 1892 Wednesday Club program took a noticeable turn away from the arts and dove headfirst into a crash course on feminism and political science. So this is like under her presidency now. She's changing the, the direction of topics. The January 1892 program featured topics on the new education, women in science, the treatment of criminals. This was followed in March with a comparison of the English and American governments and the Germany of Bismarck. It's worth noting that a highly organized women's suffrage movement was well underway in Great Britain, and Germany ratified women's suffrage two years before the United States did. So she's looking at countries that are moving towards suffrage. I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, also, two new committees were added to the club agenda in 1892, social economics and current topics. The records kept by the Wednesday Club give no indication as to whether members felt uncomfortable with what, by the standard of the time, was subversive material for a ladies' club. <laughs> but it's not unreasonable to imagine that some husbands were skeptical about the direction of the club that they were essentially financing. <laughs> It is also reasonable to imagine that some loyal wives who were uncomfortable showing their husbands the topics on the programs projected their anger towards Mrs. Moore and her overambitious agenda. Indeed, after Eva Moore's term as club president expired, a more conservative tone resumed. The program for the 1895-1896 calendar was more arts focused and included comparative analysis of French and Spanish arts legends of the monastic orders, and a review of 19th century maritime paintings. The social economic session of the program addressed a topic ripped from the headlines of 1895, the debate over silver and gold currency. <laughs> Mrs. Moore retained her membership with the Wednesday Club, but, it seems, but seems to have moved on to even more prominent roles after her term as president expired in 1894. Mrs. Moore served as the president of the Missouri Federation of Women's Rights. <coughs> her work in Missouri elevated her stature nationally, and she let's move on to the next slide here. Uh, and she became involved in the General Federation of Women's Clubs, or the GFWC, serving as a St. Louis Wednesday Club, Club delegate for the next seven years. The General Federation of Women's Clubs was an umbrella for over 3,000 local clubs and 2 million members dedicated to volunteering in the name of civic improvements. 
It was eminently progressive and upheld nonpartisan, non denominational platforms. The GFWC's motto is in unity, unity in diversity. You can see it on that uh, uh, emblem at the bottom, it's in yellow inside the white circle. Um, but that principle was not always evident, given, uh, particularly given most of the members were white, affluent, native-born Protestants. The GFWC could be a nasty arena where regional rivalries and one-upmanship existed just below the surface of Victorian etiquette. The hypocrisy of the motto is most evident in the treatment of black club women, as evidenced by the Ruffin incident of 1900. Josephine Ruffin was a black journalist who attended the GFWC convention in Milwaukee uh, and was seated with southern white club women. That might have been a bit uncomfortable. GFWC president Rebecca Douglas Lowe, a Georgia native, told Ruffin that she could not sit with the black delegation, and this seems to have caused a commotion. The perceived slight made headlines and was a major embarrassment. The next year, 1901, Mrs. Moore became the Missouri president of women's clubs, and from 1908 to 1912, she served as the national president of women's clubs, effectively becoming the leader of two million club women. Unlike the Georgian Rebecca Douglas Lowe, she was anything but provincial and seemed more interested in uniting than focusing on petty differences. She graced countless clubs across the country. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch reported that, quote, in visiting various clubs, she estimated she traveled 75,000 miles. That's the first decade of the 20th century, all by rail. Okay? It is clear that as president, Eva Perry Moore respected club autonomy, but also promoted universal ethical standards of inclusion and social justice. After visiting clubs in Arizona and California, President Moore became an enthusiast for Native American uplift and seems to have supported a model of self-sufficiency and self-governance when assimilation into mainstream American society was the program. This reflected a true appreciation for diversity. <laughs> In the early 20th century, Native American arts began to take a rightful place alongside Western art tradition, thanks in large part to progressive club women who put such topics on their programs. The excitement of hosting the World's Fair in 1904 provided club members with a unique opportunity to contribute to their community. Mrs. Moore and the other members threw their support behind the sewer district bonds that would turn the River de Pair into a massive storm sewer flowing under Forest Park. They ran into opposition, however, when they pressed, for, when they pressed Fair Commissioner David Rowland Francis for more responsibilities and planning. Francis was the mayor of St. Louis. He would eventually become the youngest governor in Missouri history. He was the, the planner of the fair. He was also uh, ambassador to uh, Russia right after World War I. Um, so really interesting, very powerful uh, guy. Um, one of the suggestions that uh, Moore and other women uh, had was for a hall of women uh, opposite the hall of man. And that was quickly dismissed. <laughs> Recent scholarship has explored the dark side of the fair, characterized by imperialist swagger and bigotry. Much less has been written about the inherent chauvinism, perhaps because at the end of the day, women who may have been in a position to speak out relented and got on the bandwagon. Whatever happened, it appears that Eva Perry Moore and David Rowland Francis endured a frosty relationship after this. Civic activism, while lauded, inevitably upset those who favored the status quo. By the turn of the century, members of the Wednesday Club struggled between service, activism, and civic participation on the one hand, and a more passive acceptance of the status quo on the other. Club member E.C. Cushman wrote, quote, the Wednesday Club has had an unusually happy and harmonious infancy, but it is now becoming old enough to have a will of its own. And I think the question is very vital whether it shall have one and the same will, which means unity and strength, or be divided against itself and thus lose its power of usefulness." End quote. Strong leaders certainly held the club together and helped smooth over differences, but perhaps the real glue was a Victorian brand of stoic politeness 
and the comfort that came with most club members' privileged positions in society. In 1906, as president of the Association of Collegiate Alumni, Ms. Moore spoke <laughs> at the National American Women's Suffrage Association Convention in Baltimore, along with Susan B. Anthony and other important women educators. She got to introduce Ms. Anthony, who was 85. And Ms. Moore was careful not to make any radical remarks which might be distorted in the press, and chose to focus on Ms. Anthony's devotion, courage, and selfishness. She pointed out that, quote, clubs innumerable have delighted to do her honor, not because they have or have not a suffrage clause, but because each and all recognize the individual devotion, the singleness of purpose that so eminently distinguished Ms. Anthony. In spite of the diplomatic tone, it's clear that Ms. Moore was firmly on the side of women's suffrage, just being there marked her. Ms. Moore's public addresses tended to focus on rational, mutually agreeable topics that she remained silent, but, and she remained silent when it came to other controversial causes championed by women like prohibition and prayer in schools. In 1908, the Wednesday Club moved to an impressive new two-story structure in the Central West End on the corner of Taylor and Westminster. So here's a picture that's from the uh, club archives of the cornerstone. Uh, being delivered, and I, I don't know who these women are, there's no caption, one might imagine that's the club president in 1908. Um, the opening reception feted Miss Moore as guest of honor, and featured British suffragette Mrs. Philip Snowden as the keynote speaker. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch reported the event as a lavish affair, offering a roster of the ladies in attendance and descriptions of the fine gowns they wore. The entry hall showcased an impressive painting by local artist Frederick G. Carpenter, right over there, okay, and a, and a mahogany table festooned with flowers. The decor won high praise for its elegance and exquisite taste. A photograph of the 600-seat auditorium revealed an impressive design and excellent, excellent natural lighting. So here is a photograph of the auditorium. This is two blocks from where I live. My dogs mark that grass. And, and so I, I walked on, and I've tried to get inside. And um, yeah, I can't. I, I wanted to get pictures of what the auditorium looked like. I can kind of see through some cracked uh, boards that there is uh, a high ceilinged entryway. And then there's just like a few stackable cheap plastic chairs inside. I, I've never seen anybody come in and out of that. Um, here it is today. That's a panoramic view from First Presbyterian uh, featuring the club. And there's the intersection of Taylor and Westminster. The central picture on the bottom is the back. There's no parking space. There's. Um, not really a lot of room for like a tent for lemonade or something like that, but there is a balcony that uh, comes out from the second floor over what I imagine is like a catering kitchen. Okay. Um, the end, okay, so uh, Mrs. William K. Bixby was acknowledged for her leadership in the building committee. The building cost about $80,000, with about half of that amount under mortgage. The Wednesday Club, with its fine building located in the city's premier neighborhood, had become an institution. In 1909, Eva Perry Moore accepted an invitation to visit the Panama Canal Zone with President William Howard Taft. The parties that followed the presidential entourage gave Mrs. Moore an opportunity to expand the network of women's clubs into Latin America while adding to her world view. In 1914, a terrible rumor about the club made its way into the newspapers. It suggested that the Wednesday Club had fallen into arrears on the clubhouse and that the club had applied for a second mortgage for $82,000. So that's $2,000 more than it cost to buy. The rumors came at a time when suffrage activities were gaining momentum in the Wednesday Club and the accusations of poor financial management really stung. The president of the club chose not to respond directly to the media, but offered a full accounting to members. In 1915, the club decided to sell $10 stocks to boost reserves. In 
Club members Martha Hughes and Elizabeth McMillan, you can see their names at the top of the list, each bought 50 stocks, uh, procuring $500 worth of ownership in the clubhouse. In the same spirit, Eva Perry Moore bought four stocks at $40. The sale of stocks was not well received. Less than one third of all Wednesday Club members ever bought in. Wow. This elicited a stern reprimand, which you can read for yourself. <laughs> Do Wednesday Club members mean it when they say that they, the club should own a clubhouse? For eight years, this has been said over and over again, but very few members have gone further and have given stock to the club to show that they meant it. <laughs> the following members and administrators of the states have done this, but the rest of us have gone thoughtlessly on our way, <laughs> not realizing that unless individuals did make these donations, the club never could be owner of the club property, nor even the majority stockholder. <laughs> So there. Uh, uh, it's important to remember that many women paid their dues through allowances granted by their husbands. And asking for more money presumably left some members between a rock and a hard place. The 1916 election for club president tells us how the majority of club members felt. Eva Perry Moore ran for president, but was defeated by Miss Halsey C. Ives, a woman who did not donate or buy any stock in 1915. <laughs> Miss Moore, it appears, seems to have quickly moved on. Biased coverage of women's issues in the press seemed to be a source of regular consternation for Mrs. Moore. In an undated but dog-eared speech entitled Clean Press, Mrs. Moore took journalists to task for sensationalist stories and yellow journalism. Particular ire was directed towards Mr. Melville Stone, who apparently blurted out at the World's Fair that, quote, not one social, no, not one line of scandal would appear in an American newspaper if not read and demanded by women. <laughs> Mr. Stone then suggested the newspapers were simply answering to market demands. It's almost like five o'clock news today. And, and were not accountable for the taste and ethics of its readers. Mr. Stone challenged the GFWC, this is the General Federation of Women's Clubs, to address this, and then he walked off the podium. Your problem. Fix it, ladies. When Mrs. Moore asked Mr. Stone for a copy of his speech, because she claimed she couldn't believe her ears, she got no response. Melville Stone's retreat from the podium must have struck a nerve with Mrs. Stone, and her critique did not pull any punches. She wrote, on you, gentlemen, rests the burden, on you the reproach for the present condition, and not until each and every one of you realize that a falsehood, written or a personal item of news gained for your journal in a way you would not gain as an individual is just as ungentlemanly a deed as if done for your own personal ends. The level of accountability she demanded from others was indeed proportionate to what she personally upheld. She must have made more than a few men uncomfortable. When America entered the Great War in 1917, President Wilson justified belligerence by claiming that American soldiers would make the world safe for democracy. The hypocrisy of such a claim in a country that prevented women, women from voting was outrageous. As the country mobilized for war, Mrs. Moore seems to have become fully activated. Not unexpectedly, there was a gulf between her ambitions and the commitment and abilities of the other club women. Already comfortable with executive responsibilities, at times the seasoned organizer grew frustrated with club women whose levels of experience and persistence did not match her own. While serving on the Women's Committee of the, National, of the Council of National Defense in 1918, Mrs. Moore reached out to the muckraking journalist and famed trust buster Ida Tarbell. If that name rings a bell, she's the one who blew open the Standard Oil Trust in 1912 and then exposed John D. Rockefeller for gouging the U.S. government on oil sales during the war. 
So she's a heavy hitter. She's, she is 60 minutes all in one woman. Okay? Um, Mrs. Moore was concerned that women's contributions to the war effort were being dismissed in the St. Louis papers. And she alluded to a high level of editorial scrutiny that prevented her letters from being published, writing, quote, the, new, the only news story that I've ever seen has been an editorial on the child welfare department, which was gotten in by another person, end quote. Balancing her frustration with remarkable tact, Ms. Moore went on, quote, the little lady who is in charge of publicity for Missouri is a very close personal friend of mine, but I have criticized to her the inability to get into the papers anything of vital moment, so that I wanted you to know that this was the only following out my statement to you, which by no means criticizes her endeavor, but I do not feel that we have the results. Like most leaders, Eva Perry Moore seems to have assumed greater risks and operated under more pressure than many around her. The fight for suffrage would surely have taken a toll on anyone committed to it, but to have to conduct oneself under the supreme restraints of Victorian culture and etiquette, and a club culture as well, would have tested the limits of human propriety. Did moments of frustration lead to flippant comments that might have upset more thin-skinned women? This is certainly a possibility. Even as she delved into politics, Mrs. Moore never abandoned more traditional Victorian causes. So here's a, a, basically a cartoon from 1917, and that's the picture of Eva Perry Moore when she was president of the General Federation of Women's Clubs. So she's in her 50s here. Okay, so uh, she didn't. She she stayed with politics, but she also. Uh, uh, promoted things like Mother's Day, which you can see here. Uh, by promoting Mother's Day, which was first celebrated in 1908, uh, this was a safe, legitimate form of activism that all women could rally around. After the passage of the 19th Amendment, she was an enthusiastic supporter of the holiday and traveled to Washington, D.C. in 1925 to commemorate it with British suffragette Lady Aberdeen. So Eva Perry Moore is the one who's bending down right in the center, laying down that wreath. Eva Perry Moore seems to have been mysteriously negated from the Wednesday Club archives. Virginia, you, you were witness to this, okay? A small single file collection of Ms. Mrs. Moore's speeches and letters exists at the Missouri Historical Society. But these speeches relate to women's suffrage, greater educational opportunities for women, jury service for women, and women's representation in the League of Nations. Not a word about the Wednesday Club. Perhaps Mrs. Moore outgrew her old club. Still, one would think that as a founding member of national renown, she would always be a welcome face and fondly remembered when she died in 1931. Surprisingly, there is no mention of her death in the club minutes, even though two other prominent founding members, Miss Simeon Ray and Mrs. William Bixby, the woman who built the clubhouse, or was on the building committee for it, also died around the same time and were respectfully included in the club minutes in memoriam. Her one-page obituary in the St. Louis Globe Democrat, that's big, did not make it to the pages of the club's scrapbooks either. But there's plenty of mention about social affairs and dresses and floral arrangements. Uh, how could the club have forgotten Mrs. Moore? We may never know. But 14 members resigned over the summer after she died. I think Miss Moore's progressive politics pushed a lot of the more conservative club members beyond their comfort level. There's no smoking gun, but there seems to be a lot of circumstantial evidence to support that she was resented by a number of women and that there was a conservative backlash against her. Even as she asserted her views with politeness and tact, the fact that she shamelessly brought politics into an ostensibly apolitical forum was clubhouse heresy. <laughs> Mrs. Moore was ahead of her time in understanding that in America, every aspect of life is political. 
Where one lives, what one buys, and who one chooses to associate with all eventually factor into our great democratic debate. Informed activism is the antidote to despotism. Mrs. Moore simply wanted American women to be educated and actively engaged in the American experiment, not passive, naive observers. For that matter, her letters insisting on positions being open to women in the League of Nations suggest that she wanted all women to be empowered. Eva Perry Moore may have been a subversive agitator to some, but she was a pioneer to many others. Beyond her duties as housewife and mother, she lived a life dedicated to the education, advancement, and elevation of women. Ironically, the gains made by women's suffrage and economic empowerment in the 20th century have undermined the old club culture even more than cable television and the internet. <laughs> 125 years after the founding of the Wednesday Club, lectures like this one are lost on the millions of women who are working at this very hour. And when I return to the classroom, there will likely be more women in it than men. Even though she was a co-edit Vassar, I think Mrs. Moore would be a bit uncomfortable with modern forms of gender blending in education. She would certainly be upset about going to college for the sake of employment. In her mind, a good education inspired the spirit toward goodness. She would also frown on the compromises that careerism has placed on motherhood. <coughs> and then there is the concern that so much good education is being wasted on our distracted youth. For those privileged enough to afford it, women's clubs fill this void wonderfully. There is indeed still a place for intellectual stimulation geared towards mature minds, unhampered by grades and degrees. Eva Perry Moore saw the clubs as a resource for addressing the alienation of domestic life, but she also saw them as an organizing force for addressing inequality and chauvinism. That's Belfontin Cemetery, plot 3385, which <coughs> taken yesterday. Uh, she lies next to her husband, who died 14 months before her. Uh, Eva Perry Moore is a fascinating character, and her example sheds light on the great contributions club culture made in the progressive era. She was a woman of keen intellect and incredible, incredible energy. She revealed her secret to youth in, 19, in a 1906 speech to club women as, quote, Devoting oneself to something higher than self. This is the answer of the ages to those who would find the source of immortal energy and enjoyment. When she died in 1931, that's how she was remembered. Thank you.